The treatment approach for ER positive HER2 normal disease uh, has really evolved over the last couple of decades, and there certainly isn't one treatment approach, so it's difficult to encompass it all in one recommendation. I think what we've discovered is that the biology of ER-positive disease is quite heterogeneous, even when you exclude the HER2 uh, amplified tumors. And what we're understanding is that the uh, prognosis is affected both by the biologic characteristics of a tumor, uh, which can include many other factors than ER, as well as the clinical pathologic characteristics, and that by looking at the genomics of these cancers, we can better understand w what the right treatment is, the tri treatment approach is for early stage ER positive cancers. So our treatment modalities, of course, include adjuvant hormone therapy, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. And it's the combination of those different treatments that we're really trying to improve by uh, adding in different factors that help us understand these cancers. Most recently, we've understood a little bit more about optimal chemotherapy regimens, although we're still learning more, certainly. Uh, and the recent data from ASCO in 2013 told us more about longer duration hormone therapy. So how to incorporate all those different treatments into the therapy, the best therapy for ER positive early stage breast cancer is really the critical uh, issues that we face in our practices. Luminal breast cancer is kind of an uh, overall term that uh, has been used to indicate hormone receptor positive disease. We understand, and actually we saw some of this data most recently at San Antonio and ASCO, that ER positive breast cancer may fall into different uh, subtypes that are outside of the luminal types. But within luminal breast cancer, there's clearly a more proliferative, aggressive type of cancer and a much more slowly growing, uh, indolent type of cancer. Uh, the cancers that are more aggressive tend to have a better response to adjuvant chemotherapy, and both groups of cancers seem to benefit from the addition of adjuvant hormone therapy, although clearly the differential benefit uh, is greater in the indolent cancers than it is in the more aggressive cancers. So uh, again, I think that our challenge really is to try and understand this heterogeneity and put together the different modalities in the best possible way. We've also learned, for example, that very slow-growing ER-positive cancers in older women with big margins of normal tissue around the tumor uh, may not need radiation therapy up front, for example. And these are all similar considerations as we put them together. The last thing that I think that is important to us, other than just understanding who needs chemotherapy or not, is to understand which cancers are going to be more responsive or less responsive to endocrine therapy, uh, both upfront and over time. And those cancers, we the very responsive cancers with a higher risk long term, we may choose longer duration hormone therapy based on our recent and uh, now several year old data with tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. The higher risk tumors that are endocrine resistant, we need to use appropriate chemotherapy, and then we may also be adding in targeted biologic agents to improve the response to hormone therapy. We know that tumor size and grade uh, impact prognosis. So we know that this is an important indicator in terms of risk of recurrence. Of course, node status impacts the risk of recurrence as well, and we're mostly talking about node negative tumors here, so we won't talk about that much more. Uh, grade is interesting because uh, grade is determined by uh, actually counting up, giving a numerical score to a number of different features seen under the microscope. And what we understand is that although GRADE gives us an idea about the prognosis of the cancer and the biology of the cancer, it's not very reproducible, so that when pathologists send around tumor samples, they only agree about 50% of the time. And in particular, the difference between low and intermediate and intermediate and high is simply one point. So you can see that there may be great uh, variations in grading depending on what part of the tumor you're looking at and who's actually looking at the tumor. Uh, so I think that we use these features most effectively to determine 
common uh, prognosis. But in terms of predicting benefit from chemotherapy, tumor grade has a, a lot to be desired. And uh, it is what we've had to use for many decades, uh, but it clearly leaves uh, some problems in terms of not really getting an accurate feeling for what biology the cancer is representing. In terms of size of the tumor, that doesn't really help us. Uh, size tells us more about prognosis than it predicts benefit from treatment. You may have a very slow-growing large tumor uh, that has negative nodes and will has a very low chance of responding to chemotherapy, whereas you may have a small tumor that's very aggressive and will respond well to chemotherapy and, in fact, is relatively hormone resistant. So size really doesn't help us a lot, and tumor grade, unfortunately, is not as reproducible as we would like it to be, similar, actually, to the proliferation marker, KI-67. In terms of uh, ER, PR, and HER2, we really, I think as an international community, put a lot of effort into trying to standardize these tests and, and reporting. Uh, interestingly, we've learned something about the subtypes now, uh, a little bit more about what ER positivity is meaningful in terms of hormone response. And HER2, there actually will be new guidelines that come out very uh, in the near future that will help us a little bit in terms of determining HER2. What we know for sure is that these are important prognostic markers and they in general predict response to therapy. So ER predicts response to hormone therapy, HER2 predicts response to both chemotherapy and HER2-directed therapy. And in fact, HER2 is the best marker to predict response to HER2-directed therapy. The problems that we have is that there are a lot of gray areas and how we fit all these markers together with the biology of the cancer is complicated. HER2 is a better standalone test than ER because as we discussed earlier, uh, ER positive tumors are very heterogeneous, much more so than HER2 positive cancers, and can involve tumors that have relative resistance to hormone therapy, are more aggressive and are more responsive to chemotherapy, uh, and also include extremely indolent cancers where the risk of recurrence primarily is in 10 years and is mainly affected by longer duration hormone therapy. Tools like Adjuvant Online and Predict actually take published studies that randomize large number of patients with early stage breast cancers to receive different types of therapy, and then try and use those databases to predict what a patient with a current day tumor uh, might be expected to experience in terms of their risk of recurrence and risk of dying of cancer. The problem that we have with those tools is they don't individualize for the biology of the cancer. And they use uh, specific factors such as tumor size, node status, and age, as well as comorbidities to try and predict risk of recurrence and benefit from therapy. So the real, it, it, when we're thinking about those issues with these online predictors, the lack of individuality to the patient tumor becomes a problem. Uh, as does other features. So most of these tools do not include HER2, which we know markedly uh, increases sensitivity to chemotherapy, and now we use HER2-targeted therapy in almost every patient. So it doesn't really apply to that group of patients. But the problem is that it contaminates the whole database that we're using, and it improves relatively the response to chemotherapy based on what we really see in the tumor population that have HER2-normal disease. So that's one complication. Second complication is that the uh, comorbidity scales are problematic because we can treat patients for comorbidities better now than we could before. So the so-called Charleston index may not be a very good predictor of the risk of mortality uh, and intolerance of therapy uh, as much as it was when it was developed some decades ago. And then the third problem uh, really is that the percent benefit from chemotherapy and hormone therapy is static. So it says, in this trial of 3,800 patients with very heterogeneous cancers, we saw a 30% relative reduction in risk of recurrence if we used chemo this type of chemotherapy. But unfortunately, the relative risk, the, the benefit, is hugely variable depending on what 
biology of cancer you have. If you have a very slow growing cancer, the benefit is small. If you have a very aggressive cancer, the benefit is much higher. And you really can't pull that out from a static calculated benefit. And then lastly, Adjuvant Online, of course, looks at mortality uh, at 10 years uh, and also looks at risk of recurrence. The risk of recurrence includes local and distant recurrence. And you don't really know what the margins were. And mar we paid a lot less attention to margin and we had different imaging studies in the past. So the local recurrence we know was a much higher risk from these older studies. And they, again, contaminate the risk of recurrence. So if you see these big risks of recurrence and a relatively good reduction from chemotherapy, you're motivated to use chemotherapy when in fact the true benefit for that individual cancer is relatively small. So because of that, we really use those online predictors much less frequently now than we did before.